To conclude our discussion of the universal church, we will briefly consider the relationship between the church and Israel. As we have already stated, the two have many similarities, but they are not the same thing. To understand the relationship between the two, we must first understand the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in Scripture is God's entire exhaustive program of salvation. The kingdom of God was established at creation. God created the universe as his kingdom and appointed human beings to serve as its rulers in Genesis 1.26. God gave them dominion over the earth. Dominion is simp simply another word for kingdom. God's kingdom was broken at the fall when men and women abused their position of authority. Paradise was lost. Ever since... God has been actively working to vanquish evil and restore his perfect reign over creation. This is what we mean when we talk about the kingdom of God, the restoration of God's reign on the earth. Israel had an important part in this process. The nation of Israel was established in Genesis 12, when God called Abraham to leave his homeland and travel by faith to the promised land. God promised three things to Abram. A land, which was the promised land. A great nation, which was the nation of Israel. And a blessing upon all the other families of the earth. This idea of blessing is key. Through the nation of Israel, God intended to send his blessing upon the entire world. God's model for how this should work through the nation of Israel is seen in Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God intended Israel to be holy, distinct, separate. All the nations of the world were to look at Israel and realize this difference. This, in turn, was meant to turn the nations to Yahweh. This happened from time to time throughout the Old Testament. For example, during the reign of Solomon, we see the Queen of Sheba traveling to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. By and large, however, Israel failed in this role. This leads us to what we call the replacement view. Common terms for this teaching include replacement theology, reformed theology, or covenant theology. These theologians emphasize Israel's failure to live up to her God-given mandate. Instead of being a model to the rest of the world, Israel tended to adopt the idolatry of her surrounding nations. Therefore, God scattered his chosen nation, sending Israel into captivity. Replacement theologians teach that the church was then established to replace Israel, taking on the task in which Israel had failed. God's promises of a kingdom are being fulfilled spiritually in the church right now. The church, then, is the new Israel. The replacement view does make some excellent points, but there are also some major problems with this line of thinking. First, we observe that God's covenant, his promise to Abraham, was unconditional. In Genesis 17, 7 and 8, it is called an everlasting covenant, and the promised land is given for an everlasting possession. It was not contingent on Israel's obedience. If the covenant was revoked and handed over to the church, then it would not truly be everlasting. Second, we see that there are some significant prophecies about the future kingdom in the Old Testament that are very difficult to spiritualize. If God's promises to Israel have been transferred to the church in a spiritual sense, then how are do we make sense of passages like Isaiah 60, 14, and 15? In this prophecy, all the nations of the world that have persecuted Israel will come to Jerusalem to do penance. It would not really make sense for these nations to come bending low and bow down at the church. Instead, we should expect to see a day in the future when Israel will be restored as the center of God's kingdom 
and the world will apologize for mistreating her people. Third, we see in Acts 1, 6, and 7 that Jesus anticipated a future restoration of the kingdom to Israel. When his disciples asked Jesus, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? How did Jesus respond? Jesus did not say, No, the kingdom is not for Israel. Or, No, Israel has been rejected. Rather, Jesus looked ahead to a future date. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed. This answer indicates that at some time in the future, the kingdom will indeed arrive and Israel will be a part of it. Throughout the New Testament, Israel and the church are always talked about as separate entities. In 1 Corinthians 10.32, for example, Jews and the church are separate groups of people. Finally, in the teaching of Paul, we see that Israel will indeed be restored in the future. This was the entire purpose of the book of Romans, to explain the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in God's kingdom program. In Romans 11, 25, and 26, Paul explains a partial, hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Israel has been temporarily set aside so that the blessing of God might extend to the Gentiles, the entire world, just like God promised to Abraham long ago. So these arguments suggest that Israel has not been replaced or cast off. Rather, Israel has been temporarily set aside while God works through the church. Indeed, we see that Israel and the church together form the whole people of God. God's kingdom program began through Israel. God raised up the nation as a light for the entire world and used that nation to bring forth the Messiah. The nation was then set aside temporarily, as we saw in Romans 11.24. The church was grafted in to God's people, as Paul teaches in the same passage. A graft is when a branch is removed from a tree and a branch from a different tree is attached in its place. In the same way, the church has been grafted in to God's tree. Thus, we see that both Israel and the church share distinct phases in God's kingdom program. Both groups together form the people of God. So then, we can make some clear conclusions about how Israel and the church work together to form the kingdom of God. It is clear that the church is not God's kingdom. The kingdom started long before the church and will continue long after. At the same time, Members of the church are definitely citizens of the kingdom. We will all be part of God's perfect reign in the future. As replacement theologians observe, we can affirm that God's kingdom has already been inaugurated spiritually. But we would emphasize that there is still much more to come. As Hebrews 11.5 teaches, we have tasted of the age to come but not fully experienced it. The church's task is to spread the news of the kingdom, the gospel. This will be complete when the kingdom finally arrives in its fullness. At that time, the church and the king Israel will enter the kingdom together. Both entities will jointly participate in the perfect reign of God on earth.